Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, it's a delight to be here uh, to have what I'm sure will be a fantastic conversation. Um, um, so first, I want to thank the LP student group, uh, Corinne, Helia, uh, Tiffany, Madison, and Raul for all of their work uh, to put this uh, event together uh, and make it happen. Uh, this is a really exciting event. Uh, it's the second this week. Uh, where we talk about uh, civil procedure and LPE and developing uh, an LPE approach to civil procedure. Uh, so we're all really thrilled about it. Uh, and I thought I'd begin very briefly before we get to our fantastic panelists um, um, by drawing a connection between the two events um, and uh, talking a little bit about LPE and a little bit about civil procedure. Uh, uh, and then the panelists will talk much more about it. Um, so LPE, many of you in the room may be familiar with the LPE project, um, um, but very briefly, uh, I think of it as a project of analysis, critique, and reconstruction that broadens our horizons about the economy, democracy, and law. Uh, so it rejects neoclassical approaches to studying markets and resists neoliberal interventions, right? Um, so rather than thinking about efficiency and wealth maximization, uh, and, and marginal utility, uh, as ne neoclassical folks do, um, uh, LP folks look at how power constraint and coercion exist in markets um, and center the role of the state and law as its instrument uh, in constructing the economy um, 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 and expands our horizons about democracy's role in shaping and reshaping economic relationships. Um, so where is civil procedure in all of this? Um, uh, procedure matters deeply in this. Procedural rules are largely transubstantive and deeply affect economic rights, entitlements, uh, and duties. So you can't talk about economic power, marginalization, or inequality without talking about procedure, in part because rules of court procedure affect things as diverse as whether or not antitrust law or civil rights law or anti-discrimination law are going to be enforced. Housing, um, um, uh, debt collection, and some of the things that we'll probably hear about today uh, as well. And there has been a backlash against procedure precisely because of its economic role. Um, um, and so the story of procedural ret retrenchment in the United States is also part of the story of the rise of the neoliberal legal order. So I could say much more about all of this, but uh, I will turn it over to Professor Helen Hirschkopf uh, to, to introduce our panelists and begin the questions. Uh, the fantastic Helen Hirschkopf uh, is the Herbert M. and Svetlana Wachtel Professor of Constitutional Law and Liberties and Civil. the uh, Civil Liberties. I was close. I was close. Uh, and the co-director of the Arthur Garfield Hayes Civil <laughs> Liberties Program, a very short title for a fantastic moderator. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks for that warm introduction, which my mother would have loved. And thanks to all of you for coming to this conversation. And as Professor Norris explained, we're in part interested this afternoon in having somewhat of a theoretical conversation about LPE and its relationship to uh, procedure and courts. Uh, but the point isn't just to describe the world or to theorize the world. The point, if you're at law school, is to help change the world. And so we also hope to motivate a practical conversation about what I'm going to call democratic professional citizenship, what it means to be a uh, lawyer who is concerned with existing power relationships in the United States, and how you can deploy or resist the unequal power of procedure and the unequal power that courts give to people in American society. With the goal of reconstructing the United States on a more inclusive, more uh, fair, more democratic basis. And I also um, uh, see the point of gatherings of this sort as a way to um, show those of you who are, who are engaged in this struggle or thinking about engaging in this struggle to see that you're not alone and to resist the metaphor of the Lone Ranger. Nothing gets done alone and LPE teaches us that law has to be in alliance with, perhaps in service of, at least to listen to social movements, communities, and just other people. And so uh, we hope that we can motivate uh, those of you to join this sort of merry band of um, scholarly pranksters and to um, travel hopefully and uh, with a collective sense of agency. So with that, we have three fabulous uh, panelists and I'll start uh, uh, with Professor Charlton. 
uh, Copeland, who's in the middle, and I should say that their sitting says nothing about their political orientation um, <laughs> at, at all. They are all to the right of me. Um, <laughs> Professor Copeland has um, really firsthand experience in seeing and contributing to the transformative potential of law as a tool of liberation and not of oppression. Um, after he graduated from the Yale Divinity School and the Yale uh, Law School, he clerked on the Constitutional Court of South Africa um, and then on the Sixth Circuit of the Court of Appeals. He now teaches at the University of Miami Law School, where his courses include 1L procedure, of course, um, constitutional law and administrative law. And he has real world litigation experience as an associate at Hogan and Hartson in, in DC. His scholarship focuses very broadly on the federal court's enforcement of federalism and separation of powers. And his current research examines the effects of conservative social movements on law and change in society. He's also completing a dissertation um, on race and federalism in, in American political history. Among his public activities, and every lawyer should be engaged in public activities, um, he's on the board of directors of the ACLU of uh, Florida, and he served as a commissioner on the Miami-Dade County of, of, a, of an agency in Miami-Dade County uh, that is charged with enforcing ethics rules. To my immediate right um, is Catherine Sabbath who likewise brings firsthand experience to her discussion about unequal procedure, having been a staff attorney at the housing unit of what was then called South Brooklyn Legal Services um, after she graduated from this law school and was my student in the Arthur Garfield Hayes Civil Liberties uh, uh, program. So her successes are my successes, her failures are only on me. <laughs> um, as a recent law graduate, Professor Sabbath uh, served as a clerk in the Southern District of New York and in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Uh, she's currently a professor at Rutgers Law School, where she's also co-director of the Housing Justice and Tenant Solidarity Clinic. I think that we should rename our clinics here uh, with a, a name like that. She teaches, writes, and litigates about civil justice and housing, and the titles of her articles actually give you, actually give you a bigger picture of her theoretical focus. Eviction courts racial capitalism in the civil courts and the gender of Gideon. And she's currently writing, and I like it that she says her first book, meaning that there will be a second and a third, uh, Courts and Capital, How Market Power Shapes Law and Justice in the Civil Lit Litigation System, a theme that we'll certainly be discussing today. Um, and finally, to my far right is <laughs> Professor Daniel uh, with Townsend, who likewise has firsthand um, experience knowing how to leverage the power of even unequal uh, procedure on behalf of consumers, workers, and government entities that want to do right by their constituents. After graduating from the Yale Law School, he worked as a public interest lawyer at Gupta, Gupta Wessler um, in DC, and he served as a law clerk uh, to one of my favorite judges, Judge Marsha Berzon in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, um, and also on um, the District Court for the District of Columbia. He currently teaches civil procedure and trial practice and commercial law at Georgetown Law, where he studies issues of uh, consumer protection and civil procedure. His recent work, which he's going to discuss uh, this afternoon, has focused specifically on debt collection litigation in state uh, courts. His forthcoming article, Deterring Unenforceable Terms, will be coming out in the Virginia Law Review, and it builds on great empirical work about unenforceable terms. Um, and he's focusing on the normative and policy details for affirmative penalties uh, for contract drafters. And he's written, I'm happy to say, about the relationship between personal jurisdiction and nationwide class actions. So um, let's begin. LP teach, LP all of that in three minutes. Okay, so L if you're gonna be in court, you're at, you watch the clock. So. LPE teaches, of course, and you all know this if you're in this room, that markets are not natural. They are created by uh, law and procedure um, is also not natural. And it's also created by law, but it also helps to uh, create law. Procedure has distributional consequences and uh, procedure um, is contested, um, which often is not seen uh, when we discuss procedure in the first year uh, curriculum. And we tried to capture this idea in the title of this event, Unequal Procedure. So, Professor Whipstonson, 
Can you elaborate on that idea? I mean, equality can refer, equality is itself a contested uh, concept. It can refer to um, opportunity. It can refer to resources. It can refer to outcomes. It can refer to capabilities. What does equality mean in the LPE sense? And why is procedure considered to be unequal? It's a great question. It's a big question. Um, hopefully we'll hear a lot of lot of examples of it over, over the course of the panel today. And you've probably come across a lot of examples of, of unequal procedure in your classes so far. Um, I, I think that if if you were anything like, like me, and I imagine some of us and some of my classmates in law school, something that might have attracted you to law school in the first place is actually a vision of equality that the law can foster. Um, right. The, there is a kind of expectation that we have in the law of a kind of formal equality. You know, you've got um, Supreme Court building. It says, you know, equal justice under law. We've got this idea that if you have uh, a day in court, you can be an individual person going up against uh, the federal government, going up against a large corporation, and your claims will be treated with the same kind of seriousness, the same kind of gravitas that that corporation's claims would be treated with or that or the government's claims might be treated with. Um, and that is a thing that exists, right? So that is a thing that can happen in the world. And I encourage all of you, if you're interested in that kind of exercise in formal equality to pursue that. It's a way that you can be very empowered as a lawyer and you can empower others. Um, but it's also the case that that's, that kind of formal equality is heavily rationed by our system. Not, not everyone gets it, not everyone gets access to it. Even when you might nominally get access to it, you might in actuality, not really as a practical matter have access to it. Um, and when I think of unequal procedure, I think of the difference between the formal equality that's, that a lot of the law is kind of premised on, is incorporated in various kinds of rhetoric and in various kinds of doctrines, and um, other, other dimensions of inequality that exist in the world, particular material inequality, right? People who do not have access to uh, wealth, to income, um, to certain kinds of social status, right? Um, and there are ways that our procedural systems both fail to recognize that inequality in ways that mean that the promise of formal equality is, is false or, or is an illusion. And there are also ways that our procedural systems exacerbate that external inequality. Um, so in terms of failing to recognize inequality, um, you, can, uh, you can go to any courthouse uh, and you can see that the lawyers who represent natural persons are dealing with a different set of issues, uh, are dealing with a different set of processes, are given a different amount of time and public resources than the lawyers who represent large corporations. Um, you, you can attribute that, you know, you can divide that up substantively, right? Are you dealing with eviction law? Are you dealing with debt collection law? Are you dealing, um, are you dealing with anti-discrimination law versus if you're dealing with antitrust law or mergers and acquisitions or um, corporate governance? Um, you could also just go to a courtroom and look and, and realize that no matter how we rationalize each of the individual structures and each of the individual decisions that the law has made in all these areas, the net effect is quite obvious and quite transparent that people in the legal system, the vast majority of them are treated differently than corporations are. Um, in terms of how that can exacerbate inequalities, the easiest way to see it is through inaction. Right. Um, so when we have substantive laws that are designed to protect people, but those substantive laws are hard to implement, um, maybe because arbitration clauses prevent people from going into court, because class action doctrines prevent them from effectively aggregating their claims, um, then the, the courts don't, they fail to hold the promise that the substantive law might provide. Um, the other way, though, is that the courts can be effect effectively the you know the long arm of the law. They're the, they can be the big stick of of the government. Um, if you are forced out of your home, there may be a court order that's the proximate cause of of that forcing. Um, so courts aren't just exacerbating inequality by sitting the game out. They're also actively providing uh, judgments and orders that help. Uh, instantiate the current the current economic system and are really where the rubber hits the road for uh, a lot of the harm done by the economic system. Is that roughly that's that's that's, 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 that's um, what I think about unequal procedure. At okay, least. so let's actually move from the general to the specific rules that you all are studying in one uh, L and in uh, maybe federal courts or maybe in complex uh, litigation. And Professor Ruth Townsend has spoken about 
uh, the principle of formal equality that dominates in the courts. And you know that the principle of transubstantivity is a subset. It's an entailment of the principle of formal uh, quality. And he's talked about uh, procedure and the power that procedure gives litigants as rationed. And a part of that also is the idea that legal rights and legal claims are a commodity. They can be sold and purchased on uh, the, the market and legal representation is not a right. It has to be uh, purchased. So let's drill down on some very specific examples in the federal courts. Um, and in particular to focus on the ways in which existing rules exacerbate power dynamics in the United States, but also what you can do about those power dynamics. Again, the idea is not just to accept the status quo, the idea is to figure out some strategy for dealing with it. Uh, so Professor Copeland, you've written about personal jurisdiction and business interests, all of which is very relevant to Federal Rule 4. You all, of course, remember what Federal Rule 4 is, serves the process. And that very ordinary rule has uh, very significant consequences uh, in establishing the court's personal jurisdiction, its power to enter a judgment against a defendant, and its power to provide relief. Uh, so why would you call personal jurisdiction doctrine and Rule 4 unequal and what are its real world consequences and how do we deal with it first thank you guys for for being here uh thank you for having me um so i want to want to vary off the script just for just a second because you mentioned south africa and so i wanted to sort of um start a bit with south africa in part because uh of my right my commitment in law school was to go to this new place and sort of be a part of this transformative new democracy um and one piece of that transformative new democracy was a constitution that actually included socioeconomic rights, um, uh, the right to housing, the right to health care, right? The week I arrived in South Africa, the court was hearing um, the, the case around whether or not the state was obligated to provide antiretrovirals um, to HIV positive, particularly mothers uh, at the time. And, then the, 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 and, and so I say that uh, to come back to the question of procedure, because at the court, both in uh, earlier cases that the court had decided around housing and in that case, which ultimately the, the, the court made a, a, a really sort of courageous uh, step uh, with respect to enforcing that right, the justices worried about questions of justiciability, right? That, that at bottom, even with this articulated substantive right in the constitution to housing and to healthcare and the like, the court wondered, well, what's our role in this? What is, and, and so again, these questions of procedure, even when we have a text that is uh, in some sense, the marvel of the world uh, with respect to socioeconomic rights, um, questions of procedure um, acted as constraints on the realization of that. But now to go back to, to Professor Hirschkoff's um, specific point, um, one of the things that 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 I am thinking about, uh, and this goes back in some sense to uh, Professor Norris's point about the the sort of neoliberal legal movements, um, is the construction of um, uh, what Professor Wolf Townsend says is a kind of corporate identity, right? So he 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 articulated a, a, what it means to sort of represent a an individual client, what it means to represent a corporate client. I want to ask the question of, well, when did all corporate clients begin to be the same? That is to say, sometimes corporate clients sue other corporate clients, and so you'd expect them to have some divergence of interest. And one of the things that I wanted to explore in uh, the personal jurisdiction context was, how did that cease to be? How did, right? So to go back to a space that you know well, if you go back and read the briefs in Asahi, did I give you tremors? Um, Right. If you go back and read the briefs in Asahi, you've got uh, the sort of international chambers of commerce who are arguing against California's exercise of personal jurisdiction. But you've got the California and U.S. chambers of commerce actually submitting briefs on the other side. Right. Because in some sense, they see their interests as th they are in bed with international corporations. Sometimes those international corporations uh, fail to live up to their guarantees. And so they see themselves as both plaintiffs sometimes and defendants at other times, right? And I wanted to ask, so when did that cease, right? Because Asahi is one of these first cases in which we begin to see um, a kind of 
I don't want to say ideological because there's an ideological split every time we sort of disagree, but the ideological split began to have partisan dimensions in Asahi, right? When you go back to the other cases, and, and I can't quote their names, you can better than I, right? You, you see Byron White fighting with Brennan, right? You see Justice Black fighting with Justice Warren, Chief Justice Warren, right? So that looks like a kind of intra-family affair. But at some point, the, 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 the disputes and the fights begin to look less intra-familial in that sense, right? That is to say, justices appointed by Republican presidents versus justices appointed by Democratic presidents begin to kind of split. And I, again, I wanted to know why, and there is a deep answer to that why. That is to say, the construction of a kind of collective corporate identity through the, the chambers of commerce, through um, uh, conservative legal movements or neoliberal legal movements, and the, the sort of uh, adjunct organizations and, and the networks that attach to that, um, in part, helps to create the conditions for um, an unequal procedure. Right. So again, if you look at uh, what was what's the most recent case, the, the big the Ford case that you guys rate. Right. Um, if you go back and look at the briefs submitted in that case, they don't look anything like the, the sort of interest split that you might have seen. You're not going to see chambers of commerce on both sides of the the appellant and 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 and, and, and uh, the respondent uh, briefs. You're going to see. Uh, a, a host of corporate interests who are lined up on one side and maybe some, you know, state AGs and some, you know, uh, uh, consumer protection folks. Uh, and strangely enough, law professors are often on both sides <laughs> of these Vs. So we've got some explaining to do. But again, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm most interested in is the politics behind uh, and the politics that creates these unequal rules, right? Because again, they, they, they don't come from nowhere. And how do we interrogate uh, the sort of political roots of, of that? Thank you. And, and keep in mind that all of these developments are following in the wake of the 1960s and the civil rights movement. And in some sense, they are a reaction mm -hmm. to um, organized efforts by the, the poor and persons of color to gain some access to power structures in the United States. So, but let's give some other examples. I mean, Professor Wilkes Thompson, you've also written about personal jurisdiction and you've written about class actions. And of course, the 1966 amendments to the class action rule were designed to extend aggregate litigation to really new interests that had been otherwise outside this collective mechanism. So tell us how, well, tell us how Bristol Myers Scrib, another case that you're, you covered all in 1L, um, affects or, or will be expected not to uh, effect uh, class actions. Yeah, so so you, um, if you all think back to, to 1L Civ Pro, maybe just a semester ago for some of you, um, if you read the Bristol Myers Squibb case, you know, it's a restriction on, on personal jurisdiction in a mass action. Um, so that case was not, was not a class action. It was specifically designed by the plaintiffs to get around uh, CAFA, the Class Action Fairness Act, that would have allowed um, the defendants to remove the case to federal court. Um, but there was this question that was lingering afterwards, is how is this going to apply to class actions? Will the rule in Bristol-Myers Squibb uh, end up preventing uh, the ability of uh, out-of-state plaintiffs from being class members in uh, class actions? So if you know you have uh, you know, Wells Fargo engages in a nationwide fraudulent course of conduct, someone tries to bring a lawsuit against them in Illinois, which is not where they're at home, I don't think. Um, can you bring a nationwide class action uh, on a specific jurisdiction theory with class members from a bunch of different states? Um, and uh, the Supreme Court hasn't stepped in to resolve to resolve this issue yet. Um, but if you, but the, the one of the things that I think it really highlights is who is given the wiggle room that is sort of inherently allowed in a lot of different legal doctrines. So there is no pre-existing uh, natural law around personal jurisdiction and absent class members, right? Um, to some extent, you know, class actions are just a creation of the last few decades. There was one case in the 1970s that uh, uh, Phillips Petroleum versus Schutz that somewhat addressed the idea of out-of-state class members. But back in the day, in that day, um, General jurisdiction was so widely available that no one really needed to fight the fight around specific jurisdiction for absent class members. 
All that changed in the last 10 years um, as general jurisdiction has, has narrowed, I guess, 12 years now, um, 10 or 11 years. But uh, no one really knows what the answer is going to be. Some judges are coming out one way. Some judges are coming out another way. But if you look at the rationale that the judges who come out uh, against uh, the against class actions, really against the ability of these plaintiffs to uh, to have their day in court, they treat it as if it's an open and shut case, sort of an absolute logical question. They use this kind of formalist reasoning that often is is appealing to this kind of jurist and this kind of system. There's very little grappling with the fact that this is a choice, right? The legal system has a choice about how to construe these rights. The there's very little slippery slope in this context because this is a relative. This is the the way that you treat absent class members in per, for personal jurisdiction purposes doesn't have to apply to other personal jurisdiction questions. Doesn't have to apply to other class action questions. It's kind of its own thing, and yet there is this failure, I think, of of the law to grapple with the fact that this is a constructed solution and a failure to treat treat it as sort of a first as a question as a policy question of what do we want class actions to look like? Do we want them to be more available? Do we want them to be less available? And you can have debates along those lines, but those debates aren't the debates that are being had to most, for the most part, in the litigation about whether these rights should or should not attach at the class certification stage. I don't know if you have other thoughts about it as, as a personal jurisdiction scholar, but that's sort of how I how I see it, the, 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 the failure of formalism to actually grapple with the, the ground practicalities that are at issue. Well, I, I think that there, there's also sort of, an, a, 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 again, this is go back to, to, to the introduction to lp &E, right, that there's a sense of um, a kind of overwhelming sense of economic efficiency, right? When you, when you listen to Justice Kennedy, when he talks about personal jurisdictions, he says, um, the cost of early discovery, it's too much, right? Meaning it, 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 it looks again like, uh, the, the 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 heightened pleading sort of argument, right? That is, say, the cost of discovery is is too much in the personal jurisdiction context. It's too much in the context of 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 pleadings, right? So this this sense that um, that that's our first and most important value, right? That that it is the value of the 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 the, the, the jurisprudence of of civil procedure uh, is to sort of reduce these costs. To a bare minimum, right? Uh, uh, lest we be over, uh, we be we 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 be flooded with uh, uh, cases that have no merit, right? And so there's this there's this sense inherently that this is the function of the courts. That in in fact this is the function of procedure. It's not a day in court. There's no right, or or, or it doesn't even feel like we're balancing those values, right? And so um, again, this goes back to this question of why LP and E in some sense as a critique against this this seeming overwhelming commitment to an economic efficiency model of of procedure and i'll i'll say during the q and a we can we can explore more issues of the federal rules of civil procedure and we could also discuss which i'm sure is dear to your hearts um and and we could also explore more of the history of how we got to this moment i mean uh why the opportunities and the uh pressure points of the 1960s shut down during the, the 1970s and the years that uh, followed, which actually tracks most of my professional uh, life. And we can look more at the process by which rules are made, who participates on the judicial conference, who participates in bar committees, and what work you all can do as lawyers, as members of the profession, to try to shape the, the rules of the federal courts as you think about your careers. Uh, but for now, let's pivot from the federal courts to the state courts. And of course, the 1L curriculum here, like the 1L curriculum in, at all elite law schools, focuses on the federal courts and not uh, the state courts. But the state courts are the real workhorses of the United States legal uh, system. According to the Court Statistics Project, between 2012 and 2022, 98.5% uh, of all U.S. lawsuits were filed in state court, meaning 1.5% of the cases were filed in state courts. And so the question that I have to Professor Sabbath, who studies and uh, works in the trenches of the state courts, do state courts have procedure? If they have procedure, is that procedure equal, unequal, different? Um, how does it impact the lives of ordinary people? And in particular, your focus has been on housing court. Um, 
if there's procedure and if it's une unequal, how do those procedures do down to the detriment of the tenants who find themselves and their children and their families trapped in those um, those courts? Um, thank you. And and thank you all for having me. And thank you all for being here. I know your spring break is coming up. So thank you for, for hanging out. Um, <clears throat> so I, I will turn before I turn to the specifics of, of housing and, and eviction. I want to sort of say something about where state courts fit in their relationship to federal court, because you all learn about state courts and federal courts, and they have some relationship and it's something to do with federalism. And like, that's kind of the extent, I think, of the discussion of what role state courts play. And as, as Professor Hirschkopf said, the, the role they play is they handle the enormous majority of cases, right? And so what are those cases? Well, the majority of those cases, that is the majority of case civil cases handled in this country are debt cases, eviction cases, family cases, and traffic cases. Those are the top four. If you were to combine, if you were to think of eviction as debt, I think you could say overwhelmingly the vast majority of case civil cases handled by civil courts in this country are debt collection cases. So I say this to go back to something that was said at the very beginning at the introduction about the role of the state, right? That the courts are first an arm of the state. So if we think about all the things that you've learned that courts are for and all the things that you were hoping that courts do as um, in terms of their democratic functions and both what they're designed to do and what they actually do, the majority of the doing is the processing of debt claims. So um, Professor Wolf Thompson has written um, on a lot of the specifics of that. I have not. I won't get into too much detail about it. Maybe we can talk more about it in the Q&A. But he's actually going to talk about that. All right, good. So um, <laughs> there you go. So but um, but but what I want to say, I want to again, I, what I want to say about the role of federal versus state court and this applies within state courts as well. Is there's one really basic thing about the federal courts um, beyond, you know, we talk about all the cases that are excluded from federal courts, which are increasingly, you know, that is a problem. But I want to um, talk about the cases that don't get pushed out afterwards, but never get in in the first place for a very basic reason, which is how we define diversity jurisdiction, right? There's an amount in controversy requirement. And it's a pretty large number, right? So who has issues that are considered to be worth $75,000 at stake? Not me. Um, often corporations, right? Like who deals in these quantities of money? Who has the capital so that the harms that they experience, the you know, the property that they lose and then need to be compensated for, the amount of money they have available to address their harms and then be compensated for that, who does that? Well, usually not ordinary humans, but corporations. Um, I will say that state court, so so that there's a whole lot more I could say about this. And I wrote about this in a, um, an LPE blog post a few years back. Um, but uh, there's, you know, that's just sort of what it means to not be able to get access to federal courts and all the things that federal courts um, provide. Um, and then, But within state courts, there's also a mountain controversy requirement. So even within state courts, there's lots of different state courts. I want to be clear that not all state courts um, are, you know, without process. Some have more process and some have less process. And I'm going to argue that that is directly correlated with the mountain controversy um, requirements. And when I say I'm going to argue, I don't mean I'm going to do it all here. I'm doing it in my in my book, Courts and Capital. Um, but so I just want to say that sort of about the role of, of where state courts fit in relationship to federal courts. And sort of, you know, the fact that some claims are worth more um, in, in, term, in economic terms, you know, do, is, and the fact that some people are going to get less um, compensation for the harms they experience and that the way that we evaluate harms matching up with the market is not necessarily the most accurate way to um, assess what kind of hurt people have experienced, what kind of pain people have experienced, what deserves compensation. But those are in some ways um, problems of torts and contract law and remedies and sort of substance. But then the, the related question, the procedural question, is, well, what, why are we now dividing up our courts, segregating our courts based on that amount in controversy requirement? Why are we now sort of taking that and translating it and saying that in the distribution of the public resource that is court time and resources, we're going to give more to the parties who have more capital in terms of more likely to have more capital because they are the ones whose claims are worth more in economic terms. And I will say that I've been on panels where people are like, well, but are you saying that like the smallest case should receive as much time and attention as the biggest case? And like, but in terms of money, maybe, I mean, I, may, I don't, I mean, like there's a lot of ways we could decide what are the important cases and who should get access to the important 
fancy judges and who should get more time and who should get more technology in their courtrooms. I mean, we could talk about it, but like I haven't at all been convinced that we should do it based on how much money is at stake. There are arguments there. I don't mean there are no good arguments, right? Like if you have a bankruptcy case and lots of people's lives are affected, like I don't mean to suggest there aren't real conversations to have, but I don't think it's by any means an automatic assumption in my general gut instinct is it's not the right choice. As for um, housing courts in particular, so housing courts tend to be the lowest of courts. A lot of eviction cases are handled in small claims courts. Some are handled in cases, you know, as you all may, I don't know if some of you have actually worked in, in these settings um, or been in them personally, but they we have sort of a wide variety of courts across this country that handle eviction cases. So when I say eviction courts, that can mean, I, I use it to mean like any court that handles eviction cases, but that can be a small claims court, a court that just does eviction, um, it can be there's just like a wide variety, but they all tend to be the lowest courts. They tend to have the judges with the fewest um, criteria to, to be in their position, may not need to be law degrees. Um, they tend to be the courts, um, they just have the fewest resources. I mean, if you, if you look at the docket of, never mind the federal courts, but even the, the um, state courts with higher amounts in controversy, they just have more funding for much fewer cases. Like if you were to take someone, like a random person on the street and ask them like, would you assume that we spend more money on the courts where they have more work to do so that you can fund more, like just, see, but actually we do the inverse. Like we literally do the inverse in terms of how we we fund the, the work that is being done. So in terms of the distribution, it's the distribution of the resources to make accurate assessments of what has actually happened in terms of the facts, It to take the time to actually interpret law and write opinions to, um, all sorts of things that are the work of, of the judiciary. So um, there's also vastly different rules about what the parties can do and how the litigation goes. So I'll give just a few examples from eviction court. Um, so when you think about the procedure that goes in of a litigation that you learn about in, in terms of how it's supposed to go in federal court, you learn about that there's a complaint and there's an answer and that each of these takes a certain period of time. It can be anywhere from 20 upwards in terms of days, depending. And the reality is you often get extensions of like 30 days, right? Then you have an answer, you may have a reply, then there's a discovery process that can take months. There's a conference, da, da, da. Then there's there's lots of motions. I mean, all of this, right? You've learned about this. You may have seen this in, in, in real life, right? An eviction case, the complaint can be tacked on someone's door today and they could be in court on Monday, um, right? For their trial, for their trial. Um, the whole trial. Um, that, that's it, right? So um, so what does that mean? Well, it, it certainly means something about how much time there's available to prepare. It certainly also means something about the assumptions we have about what kind of preparation is needed. Because so, and, and the um, Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court had the opportunity to consider whether this was a problem um, in Lindsay v. Norman. And they said, it's really not a problem because the issues are so simple. Um, which, you know, might be a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Because like, if you don't allow people to have, you don't give them a right to counsel and you don't give them time to litigate or do the investigation that's necessary. And then when you get to the actual court, you give them maybe like about a minute for their entire trial and you've got empirical evidence on that. I mean, uh, the law certainly isn't going to develop, right? And then you can say the cases are simple because, you know, it's, it's, it's open and shut. So, so one thing is just the speed from the time of complaint to the time of trial. Um, and, that, and related is the speed of the actual quote unquote trial. Um, we also have um, limits on discovery. So even if there were time, some, uh, a lot of cases across the country, there's, you're literally not permitted to take discovery even if you, you had the time. There are some jurisdictions where eviction cases do take longer. I don't mean to suggest that that's never the case. There's somewhere you can have 30 days or more, but many of them, you literally are not permitted to do discovery. Um, there's also actual statutory limits on the counterclaims you can raise. So you've all probably learned about the warranty of habitability um, in property law, right? If the conditions of the apartment are substandard, that's a fairly basic response to an unpaid rent claim. Well, in a lot of courts in this country, if you're a tenant facing eviction for non-payment of rent and you live in a horrible conditions, you're actually not allowed to raise it as a defense. It's just the court doesn't have the jurisdiction to handle that claim at the same time. They only have the jurisdiction to handle whether or not you paid the rent. And the U.S. Supreme Court has blessed this as well in the same Lindsay versus Normant case in which they said the issues are so simple, so we don't need a lot of time to adjudicate them. Um, so those are just a few examples. I, I um, As Professor Hirschkoff mentioned, I wrote an article called Eviction Courts where I identified 10 of these kinds of things. There's actually more than 10. 
Um, the, but one thing I will add is even though I wrote that about eviction cases, it's not really true that it's just eviction cases. Debt collection cases, although often um, in slightly more sophisticated courts, they're not always, are often still handled with the same sort of um, lack of process, I would say. And you know, both debt and eviction cases are resolved simply by default in an enormous number of cases. Um, the figures range from 15 to 20 um, to um, upwards to, to even higher for debt cases. So there's just sort of like a variety of ways in which um, the, the procedure of it, um, it, it's not, it's such a different animal almost than what you learn about as what a, what a procedure would be. Well, thank you. And I'm going to pick up where you talked about debt collection cases. I'm going to turn to Professor Wood uh, uh, Townsend. And your study of debt collection is pretty grim. I mean, it, it's a study of law being used to distribute power and wealth up rather than uh, down. And the students in this room, and we'll open it up for questions in probably two or three minutes, so we have time, um, you know, are in this room because they're interested in using law to uh, reduce inequality, to reduce subordination, to constrain market overreaching. And that goal seems pretty tough, uh, given the barriers of unequal uh, procedure. Yet LPE urges everybody to think in terms of non-reformist uh, reforms. So what does that strategy mean in, the, in even a limited incremental way in the context of your study of debt collection cases? Yes. Where, where are the pressure points that you can hope to bring case by case, person by person, uh, docket number by docket number. So the 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 there are a lot of problems with debt collection litigation. Uh, it's true. I think one of the the main problems is that there there are actually a bunch of pretty good laws on the books protecting people in the debt collection context. You know, they could be better, but um, statutes of limitations that make debts go away, um, protections against uh, taking certain kinds of wages or you know, leaving a certain amount of money in your bank accounts, you can still pay the rent, um, you can keep your public benefits. But the uh, main problem is that these laws don't get enforced um, because of the default judgment problem that Professor Savage was just talking about. So one of the most effective things that people can do to help someone with a debt collection case is just to show up, um, right? To be a lawyer that helps someone with a case is inherently useful. Um, but I also think it's... Um, there are a lot of reforms that are conceptually quite bold while still remaining relatively practical. Um, so uh, one of the main reforms people are working on in this area is just a requirement that if, if someone doesn't show up to defend their case in a debt collection case, the judge has to proactively go through the plaintiff's filings and kind of do at least a little bit of a check to make, it, make sure that the statute of limitations doesn't apply, that the evidence documents the right amount of debt that certain types of debt aren't uh, being collected, that you know, there are certain violations, statutory protections that are being applied. Um, conceptually, this is a big step, right? It's a move away from the adversarial system toward one in which the judge does some investigation of the case, um, even without a defendant showing up. But it is uh, a small lift compared to certain things, to compared to other kinds of uh, interventions that would help people so much more, like a civil Gideon right or something like that. It's much smaller in terms of the cost to the public than that. And legislators have been pretty open to it, and courts have been open to it uh, as well. So I think that's maybe one one lesson on on the non-reformist reform side is for people to be able to sort of think big conceptually while being able to act small or maybe act precisely when it comes to tailoring interventions to whatever the moment can hold for however you can help help people, whether that's in an individual case or reforming a particular rule. I would just totally echo Professor Hirschkoff's sentiment that, that you should all be looking into being on rules committees and bar committees and um, be involved in the public deliberation around these things, because that's where these kind of reforms that are getting judges to take more active care of cases, these happen in local rules committees. Um, and those are places where you can often make a big difference. It's gonna take time, it's gonna take effort, and it won't always involve immediate victories, but I would definitely encourage you all to, to look at that, that sort of opportunity. Well, thank you. And we could continue being, um, no, no, it's no, we, no, now we're going to hear from you. We're, we're going to stop being talking heads, although we can continue being talking heads. We have other questions that we can uh, discuss, but we really wanna hear from you. So what are your questions? What are your concerns? What are your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations before you go on spring break? No pressure. Yes. 
Hi, I'm Rita Wang. Um, I'm a 1L and I use they, them pronouns. Um, so I and a few others in this class, uh, in this room right now, we all took 1L civil procedure with Professor Maria Glover, um, who's a colleague of Professor Townsend's at Georgetown. And um, I was talking to her last week and she was really encouraging me because like, as per Professor Kirschkopf says, everyone at like elite law schools gets funneled into like doing federal courts because they're prestigious. She was really encouraging me to look into arbitration. And she said like arbitration because there's like, you can set your own rules. There are ways you can be imaginative imaginative and think about like civil procedure more creatively. Um, and so I just like wanted to ask that as a question about like, like, like cool rules that people have heard about through arbitration or like things that are going on in the civil procedure space about arbitration. Maybe would you like to take that? No? Well, first, for those of you who don't know what arbitration is, it's a contractual mechanism of dispute resolution. It is private. Um, it depends on the power of the court to enforce a judgment should there be non-compliance. Arbitration and mediation came into uh, vogue in the 1960s, early 1970s, as a form of alternative dispute resolution. And the promise of arbitration was that it would be cheaper, faster, it would be an alternative to the adversarial uh, model, the win-lose the win model, and instead you'd come away with um, bespoke procedure and bespoke substance. Um, that's not the way it turned out. Uh, like every private contractual mechanism, it has become dominated by corporate uh, interests. When you apply for jobs, particularly if some of you are going to go work at firms, your job contract will say that all of your disputes will be decided by arbitration. In the current moment, where are the opportunities for all of you? Uh, to uh, leverage uh, alternative dispute mechanism systems on behalf of consumers and workers. Well, there's been pushback and for example, on behalf of um, DoorDash drivers. Uh, so for example, um, uh, most arbitration clauses require you to arbitrate single file uh, case by case. That means you don't get the economies of scale from arbitrating with other individuals. And it means you don't get to share information that you learn from your arbitration because arbitration is uh, by contract, but almost by definition, private. The information isn't shared. The information um, is not shared in the way that public judgments are shared. So if you arbitrate your toaster that blew up in your face, I'm not going to know that I'm going to get burnt if I put that blog in my, my kitchen. How do you get that in? How do you make that information to be public? There have been efforts, and the DoorDash case is one of those efforts, to bring aggregate procedure of the sort that Professor Wolf Townsend uh, was talking about uh, to arbitration. What was the result? The result was that corporations that engaged in arbitration immediately changed the rules of the arbitration conventions that they use. So do I think that arbitration is an alternative? I think that anything that would be uh, cheaper but respectful and recognize that dispute resolution is a public process in which information must be shared, in which we as democratic citizens get to benefit from litigation. It is not just um, a private activity in which one seeks to maximize wealth. Um, if you can uh, uh, adapt arbitration in light of democratic and dig dignitary goals, I'd say go forth and multiply. Um, that's what I would say. Next question, Danny. Um, I have two questions. He wants to know about justiciability doctrine, whether it's on the exam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what one sort of practical and maybe one more theoretical in the sky. Um, practical question. I'm curious about uh, what you think the effect on procedural equality is of having mass courts be removed from class actions like the MDL context in general. Mm -hmm. Pretty practical. Um, and then more pie in the sky question. Um, I was wondering, I guess, so it seems like we're discussing procedural equality. That's sort of <laughs> interesting to hear. Um, in a context where different parties are coming into the courts, even if they have access to the civil justice system with very different levels of resources, their capacity to actually, you know, uh, bring 
I guess, meaningful representation uh, is going to vary depending on pre-existing inequalities. Um, I'm curious if you can, if there's some interaction between how we're thinking about what uh, procedural equality looks like and how you think about these background inequalities that we've got here. Teacher, who wants to first take the case of the question about torts and whether they're adjudicated through the class action mechanism or through multi-district litigation? Yeah. Well, uh, do you know what, what do, you, do you want to do? Sure. So, yeah. so I mean, I think the, the question about uh, aggregate claims, aggregate litigation, moving into MDLs instead of class actions and how it impacts uh, inequality. First of all, it's hard to generalize about either class actions or about MDLs. Some MDLs are totally different than others. But um, the, the, the concern that I have about MDLs, and it's not just, just me, um, so this may not be original, but... Um, is that uh, there's some evidence that the uh, plaintiff's lawyers are not doing a very good job of representing their class member or their client's interests in the MDLs and are very quick to cut a bargain um, and are do all engage in all sorts of negotiation and claims processing um, maneuvers that are good at getting money quickly, but maybe give some significant subset of their clients the short end of the stick. That can happen in class actions too. But I do think that we have more of a tradition and more doctrine built up around like Rule 23E, for instance, of judges policing class action settlements. And there's like a vocabulary and there uh, are tests and there's precedent around judges trying to make sure um, that absent class members aren't being taken advantage of by, by their plaintiff's lawyers. And I worry that in the MDLs, our mechanisms are not as robust. I say this as a former plaintiff's lawyer, right? It's easy to, to throw plaintiff's lawyers under the bus. Um, and I think they do a lot of good in the world. But that's I think that would be one area that I would be most concerned about with the movement from class actions to MDLs. I don't know other reactions. I think you, you just to add on to that, and, um, and I'm going to sort of name names so that you can... Um, Look, look stuff up, right? Um, uh, Professor Brooke Coleman has written about the, the 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 sort of gender of the MDL process, right? That that in some sense this is a it's, there's there's a sort of inbreeding okay. of, of of sorts in the in the MDL litigation contest, much more so than in class. I, right? I, I mean, elite lawyering is elite lawyering, but I think the MDL process is 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 more inbred. It's more it's more male, it's more white uh, than even the class action context. Uh, and 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 she's she's written I, I I think some thoughtful critiques of 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 those distinctions in ways that I think have uh, some negative consequences for the for client interests and 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 just sort of seeing cases seeing the kinds of cases that that might be eligible for these sorts of things. Now the second I'm sorry please, yes please please I want to speak to the second question in the interest of. Okay, so the second question that speaks to the material conditions of the adversarial assumptions that inform all of the procedure that you study. Professor Sabat, take it away. So, so I think, um, so I think there's, a, I want to say a little bit to flesh out what I think some of the pro the challenges are, but then I want to try to provide something hopeful because I know that otherwise you'll do that, right? So, um, so on the on the on the material, so some of the challenges, right? So. We know that like, even if you give people a right to counsel, it gets complicated to think about well, how much time is that lawyer going to have for that particular case instead of having an army of lawyers, they're gonna have one lawyer who has so many cases. You know, Even if you have a lawyer, then what about the money for discovery, for the discovery process, both formally and informally to do the investigation, to pour over documents, to do whatever else it might be, right? Um, I will also say that when you have huge disparities of power, there's also, um, differences in just the ability to manage the litigation as a personal level based on the resources that you have, right? So whether that means that, um, I mean, just like in representation, I've done representing employment discrimination plaintiffs that, you know, and they're facing an, an entity, right? I mean, just the, what the litigation does to their life and their ability to manage their expenses and their personal life, and also just to like sit in a room for the mediation for 24 hours of something grueling, as opposed to, you know, there's just all these ways in which the, the, the inequalities of real life permeate the process and I think affect the results, right? I, I wanna sort of pivot though to say that there are some ways that I think um, you, you can change the substance of what happens in the outside world through by changing what happens in, in the courts. 
And I'm going to use the example of right to counsel because I think in some ways, you know, people talk about reformist reforms or non-reformist reforms. It's sort of like the most like reformist thing to be like, we just need more lawyers. We just need to grow the system. Um, and, um, you know, it's funny. Someone recently wrote something saying that I'm in favor of right to counsel for tenants. It's not exactly what I think I said or what I meant, but I, I think it's complicated. That said, you know, if, if you think that there shouldn't be eviction cases in the courts at all, that you don't think that a physically removing people from their homes because they can't pay their rent is the right way to solve that social problem. And, and it concerns you that, I mean, not only is there judge judicial order making happen, but there's physically a court officer will physically throw them out. So we're talking about actual violence in the hands of the state, not just paper, right? That's all true, but maybe giving people a right to counsel means fewer non-meritorious cases get filed. And we actually have empirical evidence showing just that. So it may be that some of the things that look like you're sort of playing within the system and building the system can actually get things out of the system on the other side. And that really can affect people's real lives, um, you know, because of all the ways that we know that evictions harm people, both economically and socially, not to mention, even if there's no eviction, you just have an eviction record and that, you know, exacerbates race, like, racial segregation in housing because people can't access housing. So do, do, anyway, that's just one example of a way in which I think improving actual procedure can have real substantive impacts on material inequalities. You know, and another way of saying that is we started the session by saying, um, Professor Copen uh, said that we reject the law and economics approach that efficiency is the lodestone of any uh, civil justice uh, system. But there are lessons from law and economics that actually are very useful in the design of procedure. And one of those lessons is how do you design incentive effects so that people are deterred, wrong, potential wrongdoers are deterred from taking uh, the harmful action in the first place. And what Professor Sabbath is explaining is that, and the studies all show this, if in fact you provide uh, counsel to tenants, there's greater compliance with things like the warranty of habitability. Evictions um, go down because meritorious defenses are heard. And in each of the areas of um, your life, and we will be in fact leaving this classroom because um, in efficiency grounds, we need this classroom for another uh, uh, class. Hello. Um, uh, but if you have questions, you know how to reach us. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, sorry, Adam. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is like yeah, really, really, really glad to. I guess pretty much came together.